Hello, everyone. I'm Maikiko James. I am the Director of Programs at WIF. I am so excited to be with you all today. We are in celebration of the many films and talents uh, being rightfully acknowledged for their incredible work in cinema over the past year. Um, and today's event is so special to us. Um, and so, you know, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our two guests who will be speaking with today. Uh, Elizabeth Mirzai is a director and cinematographer of nonfiction films. Her first film, Layla at the Bridge, co-directed with Gulistan Mirzai, screened at dozens of festivals, including Lucarno and Edinburgh, and had a theatrical run in the UK. Elizabeth lived in Afghanistan for over eight years. She is a film independent fellow, a Moving Picture Institute cinematography fellow, and a Sundance Collab advisor, as well as an alumna of the WIF financing intensive and mentoring programs. Her cinematography has been featured in films screened at Venice and Toronto film festivals, among others. Melanie Annan is an award-winning film and television editor with over 18 years experience working on indie dramas and documentaries. Her feature film credits include I Met a Girl, Working for the Miracle to Come and Despite the Gods by director Jennifer Lynch. Melanie has also worked on many award-winning television series, including High Life and Iggy and Ace. She's a film independent project involved fellow and also a fellow of the Berlin Talent Campus Editing Studio at the Berlin International Film Festival. Um, and we are here, of course, to discuss your film, Three Songs for Benazir, which has been nominated for an Academy Award. Congratulations to both of you. This is so exciting. Thank you so much, Nike. Um, and truly, what a moment for this film. Right now, as the world is paying specific attention to the atrocity and inhumanity of war, and yet Afghanistan, which is so directly tied to the US, I feel only gets seen here in glimpses. Um, and while its people, of course, continue to endure it for so long and consistently. Um, and in this past year, with the US forces leaving, I it came back starkly into view, but again, only momentarily. And I feel it left a lot of us thinking about and hoping that there's something we could do. Um, and, and really poignantly, I think this film points to a possibility of, of just understanding um, at least our awareness, how it can expand because it's so rooted in the humanity of the people who you show. Um, Elizabeth, can you talk a little bit about how the film came about? I read that you and Shaistan Benazir were friends for a long time before you started filming. H how did they help you shape the story? This film came about uh, through a friendship that Gulistan and I had with Shaista. We were both living in Afghanistan and um, we were living close to this camp in the, in the heart of Kabul where a lot of people ended up who were displaced by the war. We went there one time to distribute food and that's where we met Shaista. He was so full of life. He was really charismatic and funny. He started singing to us and we both felt a really strong connection with him. I know for Golasan, it was also a connection of the experience of being displaced by the war um, because Golasan is Afghan and he lost his home and land during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. Um, he became a refugee in Iran. So he said he was really able to relate to Shaista in that sense of just being displaced. And I just felt a very strong connection with him as a friend that just blossomed over the years. And um, he introduced us to Benazir and we saw there was something so um, magical and beautiful in the relationship between them that we felt we hadn't seen on film before from Afghanistan. And um, after three years of being really good friends with each other, we approached them to see if we could make a film together. And they, they are incredibly open and accessible to you both. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about filming them in such vulnerable moments in their lives. I mean, beyond just the circumstances externally, um, how did you build that trust with them? And what's the, how did your friendship and, and anything that you engendered between you, you, you know, the two couples um, lead itself to the kind of access that you were able to have with them? Yeah, well, the film would not have been possible without the friendship um, preceding it for several years, because a lot of, you know, the camp is often um, covered by journalists and kind of who come every year to kind of tell stories about displacement and the very harsh living conditions in the camp, especially in the winter. So Shaista and Benazir were familiar with the media. They had seen them come in and out, you know, especially during the winter time. But um, no one had made a film in the camp before, a documentary, like long term. And we, the access that we got is really just because we were so close by the time we actually picked up a camera. We had spent 
um, many times, like Shaisa would come to our house, Golasan would take him swimming, horseback riding before the idea of this film even came about. And even we would accompany um, him and his family to different ministries to uh, petition for access to better access to resources inside the camp. And so when we finally approached them with the idea for a film, which we, the film, the idea came about through what we saw through our friendship. And um, by that time, there was already just a really shared trust uh, between all of us. But we were also very aware about what we would and would not film. So there was many times we would be there with a camera and just not pick it up because we knew that there were certain things that we didn't want to film um, because it could endanger them in a particular way. So it was just a very delicate balance that we always had to keep aware of. And filmed over many years, right? So Melanie, I'd love to ask you, as is with documentaries, it's often not quite clear where the story is going. When did you come into the process and, and how did you both um, determine what the length of the film would be? Uh, yeah, I, I have worked with Elizabeth and Gulistan before and um, I came in and it was about a 35 minute rough cut already. And because we, we all worked together with another editor, Christoph Baumke. And um, yeah, so I came in, I think Elizabeth said, hey, can you spend a couple of days <laughs> editing <laughs> this film? Um, or yeah, having a uh, look at it. Um, and yeah, I guess we spent month, many more months on it after that, but like kind of part-time as it often happens in documentary. Um, but when I saw the footage, the rough cut and the other scenes, yeah, I was just blown away by the access, the kindness, the beautiful images. Um, yeah, I just really wanted to be involved in it. Um, yeah, it's a great story. I know they, you sort of compress six years of someone's life to 22 minutes. It's quite, yeah, it's quite, I don't know, overwhelming, I guess. <laughs> And as you, there is, you know, the span in that six years, were, were there any moments where you thought you would have a film before <laughs> the end, before he had, um, before where you decided to end, or did you wait until you'd had that span of time with them? So we had filmed um, for, you know, several years and we had all the footage on our hard drive and um, we had, uh, yeah, we had one child in between them and finished up other projects. And then we just weren't sure really, we knew the film wasn't finished, but we just, we didn't know when or how we would finish it. Um, and we were trying to keep in touch with Shyster very regularly, but it was really very, it was really difficult because every time we called, we couldn't reach him. And when we were in the United States at that point, it was just, we couldn't just like drive over to see him in the camp like we normally did. That was kind of how we just always did things. We would just show up and check in on them. Um, and so eventually one of our producers, Homayun, um, who lives in Kabul, um, went to the camp again to try to find Shaista and eventually he was told that Shaista was um, you know suffering with with addiction too and he went to bring him to this treatment center um, so that's kind of how it 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 came about that we were actually sorry my people I'm sorry I feel like I'm just rambling this and I know we're not live but I kind of want to do that again go for it yeah no problem okay I'm sorry I just like we didn't we haven't been sleeping well and my mind's like not um Okay, so the wait, can you just tell me the, can you just start from the question again? Because sure, I think- I'll, I'll do the question over again too. Okay. Thank you. Pick it. <laughs> um, so you do cover over multiple years. Did you always know that that was the full length of the timeline or were there points where maybe you thought you would be, have a film sooner than that? How did you decide you were going to cover the full six years? We, so we knew that there was something really special in what we had filmed over those several years. We knew that there, we, there was something really remarkable we felt about the story, but we just, we also felt that it wasn't finished. And when we came back to the United States for a few years, um, I was pregnant with our first child. Um, we had the baby or I had the baby <laughs> and we tried to keep in touch with Shaista, which was really difficult um, to reach him because we weren't in Kabul at that point. So we couldn't just drive over to the camp and check in on them like we used to do in the past. And his phone was off and off. Um, our producer, Homayun, would go in person to try to find them. He was always told Shaista wasn't there. We just couldn't really figure out what was happening. Um, eventually, we were set to go back to Kabul to visit family uh, for the first time with our, our, our daughter, our older daughter, and for another project as well. And we asked Homayun again to try to check in on Shaista before we came. And that's when he found out 
the circumstance that Shaisto was in. And that's when, and we decided to intervene in that at that moment. Um, so we went back to visit family and for this other project, we decided to film a little bit with him. And then we felt at that moment, like we had the, the ending of the film. How is it now? Are you able to be in touch with them? Are you connected? Um, are, are, are the subjects uh, under knowing what's happening the, with the film? Yes, we're in regular contact with them. Um, it's actually been much easier recently. So we speak to them frequently. Um, uh, Shaista, Benazir, their families, we've been able to send them support, uh, financial support from the US to help them at this time that Afghanistan is going through a, a really difficult um, economic crisis as well. Yes, very much so. So, you know, again, really incredibly important project to have, I think, for everyone at this time, but really glad to hear that you're still in touch with them. So, Elizabeth, I've read that you, you know, don't necessarily go into a film knowing what you want to capture or what the story arc will be. So when do you decide to pick up a camera? When do you know that something should be documented? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if there's any kind of consistent answer beyond the fact that we just really want to feel very close to the people and be close um, and that there's an authentic relationship at the heart of the film. I don't think um, our first film, Layla at the Bridge, um, we spent, a, you know, we spent a lot of time getting to know Layla as well before we began that film. Um, but this film was even, I think, even more different in the sense that it really, it really, it was, it was a much more closed off world and it really, um, wouldn't have been possible without that friendship. So I think for us, we never really approach it in terms of an, is an issue. Um, with our first film, Layla at the Bridge, we did not set out to make a film about the addiction epidemic in Afghanistan. What interested us was this woman, Layla, who was really detonating these stereotypes that I think that the West and many countries have about Afghan women. And just her, her belief in, in second chances for people and in the dignity and value of every human life. And that's what we were really drawn to. And through her story, it allows us to see, you know, the bigger issues facing Afghanistan at that time. And it was something similar with Shaista. You know, the film kind of thematically juggles a lot of different um, ideas, like subtly in the background. But what always the hook for us was always this relationship with Shaista and Benazir, and um, the you know the the beauty that we saw in the room between the two of them, and what happened, and how that just drowned out the war outside. And that's what pulled us in, and that is always what we kept as our focus in the story. And it is really a remarkable and beautiful relationship that you capture with all of its nuance. And I think, you know, a reminder of relationships are relationships wherever they are and, and whatever setting in which they may be. Um, Melanie, similar question to you. How do you pick the projects on which you work and, and what draws you in? Um, yeah, I work sort of between scripted and documentary. And I suppose particularly documentary I'm particular about because you yeah, really get involved for a long period, longer period of time. Um, uh, and things I like to work on are sort of um, helping, I can help bring like untold stories or unheard voices to the screen. Like, yeah, whether it's scripted or documentary, that's what I, the projects I like to work on. Um, and so obviously in this film, I was like, wow, I haven't seen any footage from a camp for displaced people from Afghanistan. I haven't seen that story. We're all used to seeing it on the news, but this was a real, way to humanize it yeah which is like a love story in a way so that's what attracted me to the project so at wif we prioritize amplifying the work of underrepresented creators um elizabeth you've talked in other spaces about the challenges you face whether it's access or funding and you've even shared wisdom with others about this in our mentoring program so do you feel in this moment there are certain challenges that are becoming more surmountable because of you know <laughs> our society or time passing um but then also i imagine there's challenges that remain can you talk a little bit about how you see the documentary terrain right now that's a great and a difficult question. Um, I, I feel like it's just, it's, it's always changing. In some ways it feels a bit tumultuous at the moment um, in terms of funding opportunities and access to those. And um, for us, it's always been on the harder side to get funding, um, especially for projects I feel like from Afghanistan, which has really essentially been all that we've been, the kind of stories that we've been working on. 
but it's been incredibly encouraging to see the way that this film has resonated. Um, you know, there was many ups and downs uh, with this film that, you know, Melanie and I, you know, and Gulasan, we all went through together, just figuring out like, you know, finding a home for it. And so it was really encouraging when we went to full frame and premiered and then Netflix came on, you know, in November. Um, so that was, that was incredible for all of us. What do you wish funders would know or think about as, as they're looking for, for opportunities to support filmmakers? Yeah, I think one thing um, that's really hard about funding is you, you spend so much time on these applications. And I mean, thankfully they've all been kind of um, streamlined, many of them to fit this kind of documentary core application, but it is a lot of work to, to do these applications. And for me, I also um, have dyslexia and it's just, it takes so long to, to write these, these things out. And um, it's really, on the one hand, it's really helpful because I think it does help to kind of crystallize your own ideas that you have um, and pitch them. But it's also, um, you're, you're also, there's not many funds and there's very little in the way of short, short film funding, I think. And um, then you wait like six months for an answer often. It's usually no. So I'm not sure what I would, <laughs> what I would say, but um, I just, I, it's, I, I'm always happy to see when, when funders give chance, give chances to people that haven't had them before. Um, and, you know, just keep in consideration that it just it's just such a long process and it would be really nice if even to get a no sooner in most cases, I think. Very, very useful, I think, for the whole uh, arena to know. Um, and, and I really do think there is an effort both on funding and support and advocacy sides to understand how to make this process simpler, um, certainly. So thank you for that. Um, and Melanie, I think we know the editing field. Similarly, it, there's a lot of disparity in terms of you know who this typical editor is. Um, how do you see your field expanding, presenting more opportunities for people, women, people, of color, queer people, disabled people, um, are, are there um, things that make you optimistic about the diversity of the editing field? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's slowly getting better. I mean, especially for females in editing, I guess it, it does seem to be getting better with like um, Pamela Martin nominated. There's normally like one person nominated in women in the editing category. But as far as, yeah, people of color go, well, yeah, I think editing could be doing could be trying much harder or we could be working harder to <clears throat> make that happen. So yeah, I think it's just about supporting people as they come up from assistant editing and giving more people opportunities. So yeah, there's and a long way to go still. And have you seen, are people um, being drawn to the editing field? How do you, you know, get people interested in editing? Um, that's a good, yeah, that's a good question because it's invisible, basically, <laughs> invisible art. And um, yeah, I think these kind of events are super helpful. So thanks for including me here. Um, yeah, I guess it's up to um, if someone falls in love with cinema or wants to work on it, they probably will research and find out. I mean, I guess that's what I did. I, I didn't even know there was editing, um, you know, as a kid or whatever. So yeah, it's just, yeah, these kind of events help and it's not, yeah. I think editing is, it is completely the invisible art, but films mm. cannot exist without it. Yeah, Truly, that's yeah. why <laughs> and we say fix it in post that the magic of film really comes so much and so through in the editing and in this project in particular. So we're really thrilled oh, to have you as well. Um, so to, to wrap up, I'd love to ask both of you and Elizabeth, we can start, you know, what after in the life of this film, obviously in this moment, this, that's very exciting, but there is clearly a family who we're seeing and, and war that continues on across the globe and particularly in Afghanistan. What should we know right now and, and what is happening in, in, this, in the sense that the, the US audience can, can contribute um, and you know, however we should be thinking about this situation, what, what would you like to share with us? Uh, well, I, I just would hope that um, we, that the United States in particular does not forget about Afghanistan. It's already really faded from the headlines. Um, it's kind of almost rare, I feel like, to see it on, on the headlines these days, what's happening in the country. Um, and so we would just hope that people remember what's happening and there are ways to support people. Um, it's important not to give up hope. There are people that are in Afghanistan right now working for good, 
who are not giving up, um, you know, Afghans themselves who, who are staying in the country to help, you know, many people that are doing this. And um, we, we have to have hope for, for what's gonna happen. We've had a lot of people reach out to us about ways that they can directly help Shaista and Benazir. And so we've, um, people have sent donations for us to send to them. And uh, that's really wonderful. And we're really happy to accept anything that people would like to send them. Um, but I think that one, one takeaway we'd really love for the film is just that there is so much beauty and um, strength in Afghan culture that we hope that this film just um, touches on. And we think that the West in particular can really do uh, well to learn a lot from. Are there projects that you're working on now that you're excited about or what, what comes next to the, through the pipeline for you? Um, yeah, I'm just keeping a bit open at the moment and waiting to see, <laughs> waiting to see what comes my way, trying to enjoy this moment. Um, yeah, and as Elizabeth said, I think, yeah, one of the most important things to take away is, yeah, not giving up hope. I mean, there's war all around the globe right now, uh, and we can, uh, this film gives you a window on just how, how lives are torn apart by this. So, um, yeah, but amongst all that, yeah, I think it's important to keep hope and important to keep telling these stories, these human stories. And Elizabeth, what are you working on right now? We, uh, Golison and I are actually writing a screenplay, a fiction screenplay, but based on a true story. Um, and we, it's our first time doing this. So we're, <laughs> we're really excited about that as we, you know, um, continue and we're hoping to work with Melanie again as well. It looks like we have a few more minutes. Um, would either of you like to talk a little bit about um, this experience? What has it been like? What What is the world of, of being Academy Award nominated? But also just, you know, I think people having more awareness um, of the subject you bring to light in your film. How have you been um, hearing the responses from people? Yeah, well, it, Golestan in particular has received so many messages from Afghans all around the world who have expressed their support of him as an Afghan filmmaker and people have said that um, they're so proud to see an Afghan filmmaker telling a story about Afghanistan um, and that it's really the first time they've seen Afghanistan repre in, represented in this, in this particular kind of story. Um, so that's been really encouraging to him and to, to me as well. And it's just been, it's been incredible. Like we started this film in, um, in 2013 with, with nothing. I and mean, we had no support the whole time. I mean, you know, up until the film was done. So we just had like a small camera. That's all we could afford at the time. This tiny outdated HD camera, um, <laughs> you know, not 2k or anything like that. And, um, we just, had no idea that it would end up nominated for an Oscar all these years later, but we just really believed that there was something remarkable in this relationship with Shaisa and Benazir that we wanted to, to share. Truly congratulations again. It's so well-deserved. It's an incredible film, so beautiful and, and so important again for this time. So thank you so much for making it and sharing Shaisa and Benazir with us. Um, and, you know, as, as WIF, we hope to support both of you and anyone else on your team who brings us these stories, especially ones that we don't often get to see. Um, so however our audience and members can support you, please let us know. We'll be sure to share links and resources um, with, with our community. Um, but as, as you know, we'll be in touch. So we hope you'll both be in touch with us too. And, and best of luck, whatever happens at the end of the month. Um, you've done an incredible, incredible service and work and piece of art for our world. So, so thank you so much for both of you for joining us.